Welcome back. In this video we're going to continue our discussion on external direct products and we're going to talk about things like how you can tell whether a direct product group is cyclic or not um, and we'll uh, introduce the fundamental theorem for finite abelian groups which is kind of a big one we'll do near the end. All right so let's get started. So here's our first theorem and it's a criterion for a direct product group to be cyclic. So we've got G and H being finite cyclic groups then the theorem says that the G plus H is cyclic if and only if the orders of the groups themselves, G and H, are relatively prime. Okay, so that's what we want to prove. We want to prove as an if and only if proof, so we want to establish that they're equivalent statements. So just before we dive into the actual proof itself, we'll start by just setting up some terminology. So we'll let the order of G be M, or that G so it doesn't look, look like an A, and the order of H be N, and we'll also note that the order of the direct product is simply equal to mn. That's a note. Okay? That, in fact, that follows. It's not something we're defining. Okay, so we'll start off by assuming that we have a cyclic group and showing they're relatively prime. So assume first this is our proof of this direction. So we'll assume that our direct product group is cyclic. And we'll talk we'll give a letter for the GCD as well. So suppose that D is the GCD of M and N, and we want to show that D is equal to one. That's what we're that's what we're trying to do. And because we've assumed it's cyclic, we'll assume that g, little g, little h is a generator. Okay, so what can we do with that? Well, if we take our element g h to the power of m n over d. Why do we want to do that? Well, this is going to give us the identity, um, identity here. So if we break that up, bring the powers inside, that's going to be g to the m to the power of n over d. Remember d is a divisor of n, so that works. And it will be g to the n, if we break it up, sorry, h to the n, we'll break it up slightly differently, to the m over d here, which will just be our identity and our identity. Hence, the order of g h, which is equal to m n, Remember, GH is the generator of our whole group. The whole group has order MN, therefore it's also the order of our generator. But what we just de uh, derived was that the order of GH is also less than or equal to MN over D. Because that gave us the entity when we took it to that power. Therefore, the only way this could be true is if D equals 1. So therefore, um, M and N must be relatively prime. And now we'll prove the opposite direction. So this time we'll suppose that they are relatively prime. And we want to show that our group is cyclic. So we know that G and H are themselves cyclic. So we'll let G be generated by little g and H be generated by little h. All right, so the order of the element G and H, what's that going to be? Well, so I'm going to, I'm going to show that this element G H is actually a generator. So I should be showing that the order of this element is equal to M N. So that will be, we know how to calculate orders now, the LCM of the order of G, order of H, which is equal to the LCM of M and N, and which, because we've assumed M and N are relatively prime, it's just equal to M times N. But that is the order of our group itself. 
Therefore, this element GH is a generator. of our cyclic group. Well, our group which is now cyclic. Okay, and that completes our proof. So we've now shown that if M and if the order of uh, G and H are relatively prime, i.e. GCD of M and N is one, then we found a generator for our group, therefore it's cyclic, and we assumed, first off, we showed that if it was cyclic, then the M and N must be relatively prime. So these two things are equivalent statements. Okay, so we'll just add a couple of corollaries to this, um, just to make it slightly more broadly applicable. So the first corollary is just an extension to a number of groups rather than just two, and it says that basically you've got a collection of finite cyclic groups and then the external direct product of these, and it turns out the external direct product is cyclic if and only if the orders of any pair of groups you choose out of there are relatively prime for all i not equal to j. So this one's not too hard to prove. We're just going to um, do an induction kind of proof on it, or at least a shortened version of that. So we'll assume that it's true for some m. And what is it in this case? We're going to assume that if that this being cyclic is equivalent to, or if and only if, GCD of ni, where n is just the order of the corresponding group for i not equal to j. Okay, so we're going to assume that statement is, is equivalent for anything up to m of these groups. And we'll note that the order of the external direct product is just equal to the product of the individual orders. Capital Pi, I equals one to M of N I. Okay, now we're going to add an extra one in. So if we take G1 plus G2 up to G M and throw in an additional group now, G M plus one, if that's cyclic, If and only if the um, the order of the first block which is the product of from i equals one to m of n i is relatively prime to the next one, n, m, plus 1. Okay, also, and stands to reason that g1 up to g, m must be cyclic also. Okay, so we are basically taking the statement, we're adding an additional group in, and this is going to be true if and only if gcd of the product, i.e. the order of the um, product of the first m terms uh, with n m plus 1 is equal to 1. Okay, so we're using theorem 8.2 directly here. So it's not quite in the form of the product of the pairs of things, it's just in the form of the product overall uh, is got to be relatively prime to uh, la uh, the order we just added in, of the group we just added in. But you can see that it follows pretty directly. If I take this statement I just wrote down, because all of the ni's are themselves relatively prime, if this GCD is 1, then the n that I just added in must be relatively prime to each of them. So there's another if and only if here, GCD of n m plus 1 with nk is equal to 1 for k between 1 and n. So let's just run through that whole argument again. We're assuming that the first m terms is cyclic, and it's equivalent to saying that the GCD of all of the individual orders is 1. They're all relatively prime to each other. 
and we wrote down the order of the whole group here. Then if we were to add a further term in, then that's we're just treating the first m terms as a single group, which has order that product, as we just wrote down, and it's got to be relatively prime to the order of the extra group we just added in, which is gm plus 1, and it has order n m plus 1. Okay, and all we have to do is just establish that that GCD being equal to 1 is equivalent to saying this here. And if you, because all of these ends are relatively prime to each other, this has to be the case. If the GCD is 1 overall of the product, then it cannot share a divisor with any of these individual pieces. Okay, so that gives us a similar criterion um, for a chain of finite cyclic groups. We just need to look at any two pairs, and they have to be relatively prime no matter which pair we take. Okay, so there's one more corollary, and that corollary is the same thing but written out just in terms of our z groups. So it says that z of n1 times n2 times nk, i.e. a cyclic group, is isomorphic to an external direct product of the factors if and only if each of those things is relatively prime. Okay, so for example, we can therefore say some things directly. I can say that Z2 plus Z3 plus Z3 plus Z7, I can combine things that are relatively prime to make bigger things. So that's going to be isomorphic to, well Z2 plus Z3 is isomorphic to Z6. There's still a factor of 3 that I can't include because it's not relatively prime. At each step, I can combine things that are relatively prime together. So I could, for example, combine the 6 and the 7 to make a 42 because 6 and 7 are relatively prime. But I can't add in the 3 because it's not relatively prime to the 6. Alternatively, I could combine the 3 and the 7 together and let the 6 out. Also isomorphic to Z6, direct product with Z21. So you can see that whenever I have two terms that are relatively prime, I can combine them together into a single Z group. Okay, so this leads us to our next theorem, which we're not going to prove, but we're going to state it. Um, and essentially it helps us to determine when we can and cannot do this kind of thing we just talked about. So our final theorem is a bit of a step forward in Galleon, we're not going to prove it, but it's worth stating here because it fits in quite nicely with the material we've been doing. So what it says is that if we've got an abelian group of order n, so it's not a group of order n, it's an abelian one, so it's the important thing to just notice as to what exactly this applies to, then that group is isomorphic to the direct product of some z groups, um, where n, the order of the group, is a product of prime powers. Okay, so... Um, p1 to the k1, p2 to the k2 times pt to the kt. So the p's are primes and not necessarily distinct. That means, for example, but let's just do an example and you'll see how this works. So we'll take, for example, we're going to find the possible structures that an abelian group of order 1176 could have. So find the isomorphism classes. So basically that's the possible groups isomorphic to. of an abelian group of order 1176. So first step is to just find out what the prime factors of this number are, and that turns out to be equal to 2 cubed times 3 times 7 squared. So we have the following possibilities therefore. Now remember that you can only combine direct product terms if the two terms are relatively prime. So these ones are all going to be distinct from each other. So first off, Z8, Z3, and Z49. That's one possible structure that a group could have. Or we could explode one of these powers of 2 into two terms, Z4 plus Z2 plus Z3, plus 49. Remember, these are not the same group because 4 and 2 are not relatively prime. Therefore, these are not isomorphic groups here. Let's just move this across a wee bit. 
And so we can continue in this way and just make sure we get all the different combinations. So Z2, we could break the 4 up into two twos. So you notice that the primes are not necessarily distinct. That's what it means when it says the primes are not necessarily distinct. Above, you can have multiple two powers if you want. Um, Z3 plus Z49. And that kind of gives us the three possibilities for splitting up this power of two. Now we can just do the same thing over again, but instead of having Z49, we can make that Z7 times Z7. So let's just cheat slightly and copy and paste that. Um, so our other three will be the same ones again, except we'll replace our Z49s with Z7 plus Z7. And that there gives us a whole list of the possible isomorphism classes. You can see there's no other way of breaking this down into prime power products that are distinct from any of these. If I combine any of these together, well, I'm just going to have things that are relatively prime if I combine relatively prime pieces. So for example, if I took this one here and tried to write Z8 plus Z21 plus Z7, that's actually something isomorphic because the 3 and the 7 are relatively prime, so multiplying them together doesn't actually give me a fundamentally different group. So unlike the previous examples when we're trying to find which ones are isomorphic to each other, now we're trying to find which breakdowns are fundamentally different. So that's why we're not bothering to combine those pieces together, and we're just looking at the different ways of splitting up the prime powers themselves. Okay, so that's enough for this video. We now have a bit of experience with these external direct products, and we can move on. So we'll catch you in the next one.